We are making a seamless transition uh, to our first uh, panel discussion, which is going to be led by Professor Renee Bowen of our School of Global Policy and Strategy. Professor Bowen is also the director of our new center on commerce and diplomacy, which is tackling many of the questions that were raised by J Jeff Immelt. So with that, let me turn this over to Professor Bowen, showing that deans are not obsessive about controlling the mic. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Peter, um, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. My name is Professor Renee Bowen, and I will be uh, chairing uh, the next session, which is, uh, interestingly enough, policy uncertainty. Laura Alfaro uh, from the Harvard Business School, also uh, formerly uh, a policymaker uh, in Costa Rica. Uh, please uh, join us uh, here. Uh, Arindam uh, Bhattacharya from the Boston Consulting Group, uh, also going to talk to us about whether or not globalization is dead next week, I understand. Uh, Preston McAfee is uh, or very lively uh, uh, Silicon Valley expert, uh, and uh, I, I believe you're a, a recovering economist. <laughs> uh, and also Scott Park uh, for uh, some reality. He's a, an actual business person uh, <laughs> operating uh, across the globe and someone who actually can, can lend some realism to this discussion. Uh, so I, I'll just kick it off uh, a little bit and really wanted to uh, thank Jeff for teeing up this discussion really nicely. Uh, as we all know, uh, we're experiencing really a tectonic shift in the way globalization is, is uh, occurring. Uh, and as Jeff pointed out, uh, this is not really led by any current uh, executive of any country. Uh, this has been building up. This populist, populist backlash against globalization has been building up. And the consequence, the outcome, has been uh, what we see now, the US-China trade war, uh, what we see now with Brexit. Uh, this is all a consequence of this populist back backlash that has been building up. Uh, and the question for a school like Global Policy and Strategy is how do we handle this? How do we approach this uh, in the next uh, coming decades. Uh, we've had uh, the general agreement on tariffs and trade since 1947, 72 years. Uh, what does the next 72 years of the global trading order look like? Uh, Jeff uh, uh, pointed to economic nationalism as the next wave. Is that really the next wave? Do we need to succumb to economic nationalism? I'd actually like to push back on that. Um, what I'd like to propose is that the global trading order that we've observed over the last 72 years indeed is broken. There are things we didn't anticipate. We need a global trading order, however. We need the rules of the game. So what we'd like to discuss, and I, I'll hand this over to my panelists in a second, uh, is what are these new rules? Uh, indeed, businesses react. Uh, the governments are the actors. The businesses are the reactors. Uh, but the government and the folks that study government need to understand what things we want these businesses to react to. Uh, so I'll just put up. Uh, very briefly, um, uh, an economic, a global economic policy uncertainty index uh, that's thanks to Baker, Bloom, and, and Davis. Um, and this global economic policy uncertainty index is uh, really a compilation of news articles, uh, tax code uh, changes across the world, uh, and disagreement among major economic forecasters. And as you can see, uh, in the 1990s, 2000, there were some uh, uh, peaks in uh, the global uh, policy uncertainty. Uh, but really, looking into 2018, it's off the charts. It's higher than it's ever been. And the question is, what can we do to mitigate that? Businesses don't like uncertainty. That's my understanding. They want to have something to react to. How do we mitigate this sort of uncertainty? How, uh, what is our responsibility as educators or policymakers to help these businesses mitigate this uncertainty? And now I'd like to turn it over first to uh, Laura Alfaro. Let me thank you for San Diego. It's always a great pleasure to come to DC. I am hoping the sun comes out. Um, <laughs> 
uh, my husband is Brazilian, I'm from Costa Rica, and I always tell him the Pacific is better. Um, <laughs> as I was listening to Jeff's speech, I, I realized we probably have the opposite background and view of the world. I was born in Lito, Costa Rica. I grew up knowing government matters and what governments do or not do shapes um, their citizens. I decided to be an economist and to study economics, to, be, to get a PhD. You couldn't do it in Costa Rica, so I had to move out. I went to Chile. I went to the U.S. I met my husband, different country, different religion. So my daughter has three countries, three nationalities, and three religions. So I'm a true believer in globalization. And for me, that was what the U.S. was about. People will come and share different views and share different lives and create a new life in the U.S. Uh, so, so I am going to push back a little bit. Just Again, it can be self-serving. Uh, I am a child of globalization. Uh, let me go back and just, again, this is the world we, we've been living. Um, it has been a, a decade of the global financial crisis, which has shaped in many ways the way we, we we see the world, uh, growth has come back, and in fact, this is going to be the longest uh, recovery the U.S. has seen. It probably shouldn't go back to the pre-crisis uh, pre period, because I do believe it was a little bit unsustainable. But, but I do think one needs to be careful with comparisons going uh, beyond a certain amount of period, because it, life was very different. Behind this background, uh, we had globalization which for many people means different things. Uh, I do think it was this increase in goods, services, capital flows, and also ideas. Behind uh, these trends, uh, three important changes. One was IT, technology. Technology did allow to start breaking the production processes, designing one country, manufacturing another, packing another, and uh, do the nice little bow at the end in a different country. All of this was allowed by uh, technology. The second big political changes, the fall of the wall, fall of uh, Soviet Union, consolidation of the European project, changes also in Latin America, and of course, changes in China. Uh, there has been a little bit going back to China, to some of the older ways, but they're not going to go back to 1979. That is a big change that has uh, in many ways, a greater lever than, than anything else that happened, and reductions on trade, capital, and policy barriers. We had the crisis, and initially, there was a fear protectionism would come back. Why? Because Great Depression, that's what it brought. It brought nationalism, fascism, communism. And there was a fear that it would come back. For a while, it was fine. The Obama years were great years. And then, had Brexit, and then, you know, um, <laughs> there's many pictures. Um, it takes a while to choose the right one that you want. Um, but let's go back um, to trade. I'm actually going to argue that the position to trade is not a majority view, or it's not clear at least that it's a majority view. It does have many loud enemies. Um, but let's start with Brexit. Brexit is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, I'm, I'm sure scholars will dedicate many years to try to understand what Brexit is. If you hear some of them, they're actually very portrayed. They want to um, lead the UK into new free trade agreements that they can't because they're being burdened by the European Union. But at the heart, Brexit was a vote for the unknown. No one knows what they voted for, and we see the outcome now. They just cannot agree. The vote was vote for your grievances. So some people voted because they hated the EU. Some others voted because they, I don't know, had a fight with the wife. Others because they couldn't lose weight. All the grievances <laughs> were into that vote. At the core, though, was a, a political fight within the Tory party, which was solved this way. Let's go for a referendum. And there is a lot of anti-migration. That I, I wouldn't deny. There is a lot of anti-migration, but, but it is not clear per se what it is. The outcome is we still don't know what Brexit is. 
Then we have the US election. Let me just remind everyone he lost the majority vote. And I usually like to say that because I know he gets upset. Uh, he lost the majority vote. But also the US is very complicated. He has these very bizarre cultural wars where this group just start also very complex coalition of many things, which again is not necessarily clear is anti-globalization, although it is, has taken a very anti-migration uh, take, and anti-migration against certain type of people. Um, and also it was the tax cut coalition. And, and in fact, this is why I think, and I'm sorry, that business should be more vocal, and this was why they were not. In Brexit, because they were probably supporting the Tory party, and so they thought they couldn't argue against the Tory party, and the US, because they all wanted the tax cut, and all, they kept that beautiful silence. But I would argue that these beautiful silences are not helping anyone. Uh, let me just show you some Gallup polls, views on trade. It was a little bit reduction in the support of trade during the global financial crisis, but it actually increased after the crisis, and before Trump won, the majority of the US was in favor of trade. What was interesting is that the Republican suite, party suite, it used to be the pro-trade party around 2011, 2012, 2013, it became a party against trade. And I don't know if he knew this, but he clearly is picking up on this. But again, it's not at all a majority vote. They're just concentrated in the right political places and the US has a complex political system, which I don't need to explain to you, you know it better than I do. Uh, in, wow, what happened there? Oh, the, the fight between Steve and Bill keeps going back to haunt us. But this is work that I'm doing with David Chor uh, from Dartmouth and Maggie Chen from George Washington University. We have been polling now for three years, a uh, different group of people, and we ask people to rank their preferences. They never tell us the most important thing they want to do is reductions on trade and tariffs. They always come with education, they always come with taxation and minimum wage. It matters a lot how you ask, it matters a lot how you uh, 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 present it, but it's not the preferred policy in the US. Um, so trade, it has always been known, it can have distribution effects, and I just say this because now there is this view that economists didn't know this, this is not true, you take any book, it's gonna tell you that. There are distributional gains and some people might lose. It tends to be the vulnerable, uneducated, in this case also rural, unable and willing to adapt. Technology is the same. There is no development without technological process, but yes, some people might win, some people might lose, and it tends to be also uneducated, rural, and willing to adapt. Best capture by a great movie, Full Monty of the 90s. I recommend to go back to this movie. The Brits have many problems, but they always tend to have a very good feel of these things and they capturing movies. It is a group of manufacturers who lost their job and were unwilling to change. They were either ashamed or many other things, they just were not willing to move to services. But services have created the bulk of the jobs everywhere. So the other thing I want to say is most of the things that can be done to diminish, I'm not saying eliminate, but diminish the cost of trade and technology are within the boundaries of government. They have always been sovereign choices. It is education, safety nets, infrastructure, that has never been at the international financial architecture, that has never been at the European level. These are things the US can do, and in many cases are at the local level. So it's an individual or local choice not to do uh, these things. Um, I do think business need to be vocal, but I do think also they need to be prepared with a world that is more uncertain. I'm not gonna tell you more than Jeff, he probably <coughs> knows this strategy better, but one does need to have a strategy that considers these political challenges. International financial architecture, and just to finish, is redesigning the solution. We all know the quotas are not correct. Um, China is not properly represented. It's interesting that all countries have a disproportional quota in these uh, international uh, institutions, World Bank, IMF. That also probably needs to change. They're not gonna change easily. But they're not gonna affect me. Like, little Costa Rica is not gonna have a quota. Uh, 
big quota. I always joke that you always hear of the G2, the G6, the G7, the G20. To have Costa Rica, we will need the G138, <laughs> which is not going to happen. And at the end of the day, quotas don't matter if the big players don't want to play by the rules. There are legitimate concerns to try to change things, but if the U.S. and China don't want to play by the rules, there's no international financial architecture that is going to change that. And that was the difference after World War II. The U.S. was willing to play by the rules, and now current leadership in the U.S. doesn't want to play by the rules. And as I said, I don't believe that is the majority view, and I do think businesses have a role in speaking out. I think they were very comfortable with some of the changes, especially the tax cut, but I think they start to need to think broader and not just their little profit margins, start to think about the world we're inheriting to our kids. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lauren. And uh, a personal note, I am also a Jamaican girl. So uh, speaking of being a globalist, Laura and I share a very uh, similar perspective. And we actually want this thing to work. Uh, so um, Arindam, uh, please go ahead and give us your thoughts. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm very much on the page where Jeff was, uh, you know, that we need a new playbook of multilateralism institutionals. And uh, over the last few years, I've been researching globalization. I had an opportunity to talk to a large number of CEOs and CXOs of global companies. And I just uh, reflect back on two conversations. One was with a board member of uh, one of the world's largest industrial company. And we were talking about it, and he said, uh, that uh, politicians seems to have forgotten that globalization was a huge win-win for the world, and that hundreds of millions of people have come out of poverty. Uh, and uh, that's an unfortunate situation. And uh, just uh, four years later, I had an opportunity to talk to a business leader where he made a very perceptive uh, comment saying that there is nothing wrong for the countries to uh, focus uh, on their benefits first to drive growth and jobs. And if they ask us, if you are operating in that country, they ask us to help in the development objectives, then we should do it. And it happened to be the same business leader or the same company. So very, very uh, kind of radical change obviously had taken place in his own thinking about globalization. And in my view, that's the reality of the world that we live today. The multilateral institutions and uh, the framework that were put in place after World War II were put in place within a certain economic and uh, political construct in the way to maximize the value that businesses create and have a more equitable, at that time, distribution of this value. And also in... in uh, in the context of uh, what I call the cultural narratives, uh, you know, which are at the societal level which uh, we have about globalization. And if you think on all three of them today, they have gone through a very, very radical change. If you just look at the economic uh, structure, I mean, as I say, even uh, at that time, yes, but even in 1980, uh, there was uh, to put it very bluntly, one alpha in the room. And uh, between uh, the US, uh, Canada, and uh, EU, they had 50% of the global GDP and drove most of the global growth. Today, we have uh, two alphas in the room. We have an aspiring alpha in India, and we have EU, which uh, has the same economic heft, but uh, probably not as big a political heft. And uh, if you look at between 2020 and 2030, the share of uh, the, the North America and the EU will come down to less than around 26, 27%, whereas the share of India and China alone would go up to maybe 32, 33%, and they'll drive 50% of the global GDP growth. The challenge is that we have very different views on globalization and values, perhaps, on uh, what they want out of globalization and how do we create a multilateral uh, framework institutions which are aligned uh, to the 
to the kind of new economic and political reality is one challenge. More importantly, if you look at how value is created over the 20th century, value was created really around two things for big companies. One was access to new customers. And there you had to go physically to the country or to the customer to be able to access them or access to the, uh, the most competitive factor costs to be able to create the maximum value. Now, if you look at both of them, today, uh, because of connectivity, the, the challenge of access to customers in many, many businesses are going away. But more interestingly, as uh, Jeff pointed out, the scale advantage that you get or the leverage that you get from access to lowest uh, factor costs is also getting eroded. And the value that is getting created today is more and more by data, supported by digital. And some of the industrial companies are actually creating more value by integrating the physical and the digital leveraging data for the connected customer. Now, the multilateral institutions and framework, the challenge is, as more of the value gets created by data, there are two sets of winners that are emerging. <coughs> two sets of winners that are emerging. Winners uh, in the two countries and two sets of companies. And the huge question, I think, uh, which is out there is how this value that will be created uh, increasingly going forward gets actually distributed in a more equitable way. And let me make this, uh, in some sense, uh, real. If you look at one of the most globalized industry, which is automotive industry, uh, today the core profit pools uh, constitute 99%. Uh, so an internal estimate of BCG is that by 2035, the core profit pools in terms of total share of profits will come down to around 60%. And new profit pools, which are around three things, electrification, data and connectivity, and mobility services will be as much as 40%. And these are completely new players, and uh, the winners are concentrated. And I think this is uh, one of the big uh, challenge that we have for multilateral systems to try and figure out how do we have a more equitable distribution. Otherwise, we will never have uh, any kind of uh, you know, aligned globalization vision. Thank you. So I want to start with uh, some universities that I advise are having trouble attracting foreign students. If, if you look at the at, uh, economic growth since World War II uh, worldwide, much of it has come from technology and improvements in skills. The U.S. in particular benefited tremendously from two big forces. One is our superior universities that uh, Jeff mentioned. Uh, these are federally funded research institutes, even when they're a state university like UCSD, much of the money comes from the federal government in research. Um, and then final, and second, the brain drain, where uh, foreigners who came to the United States were educated, stayed. Half of all tech startups are founded by immigrants. This, uh, and this, so the decline in students, this is a crisis for the United States. Immigrants work harder, they put in more hours, they're generally healthier, they make our country more prosperous. Um, and the, the sad thing is both political parties are kind of anti-immigration, mainly because immigrants don't vote, or at least they don't vote for a long time. Um, we have a much uh, less serious demographic issue uh, compared with Europe, but especially compared with China and Japan, and again, that's due to immigrants. Um, in uh, China, the number of uh, workers per, uh, per retired person will drop in half um, over the next 30 years. They, they have a, it's a, because of the one child policy, they have a really serious demographic issue. We're limiting H-1B visas. There was a story this week that, the, that we are uh, rejecting four times as many as we did just two years ago. Eric Yuan, founder of Zoom, rejected... Uh, eight times for a visa. This is a billion dollar company. I don't know if you know Zoom. Uh, every tech startup uses Zoom now. Um, so so uh, I, I would say uh, hostility to immigration is a case of the United States shooting itself in both feet, uh, and it's a large threat to our, to, to our future. 
Let me turn to uh, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is already transforming business. Uh, generally, when you uh, text with a business today in the United States, you're actually talking to a bot, at least initially. Often that's done so well that you either don't know you're talking to a bot, or at the point where you're starting to get frustrated, it rolls over to a human in a seamless way. It's, it's really kind of magic technology. Um, uh, the United States, uh, mostly through Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and IBM, and China through Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, are far and away the world leaders in AI. And AI is going to per, uh, permeate most uh, uh, businesses. It's a really good thing for the world, by the way, that there are seven companies with great AI technology, because that's a lot of competition. We see uh, pretty competitive uh, industries, even with four or five competitors. Having seven uh, successful competitors is, is, uh, really, is a really big deal. Um, a little side note, in the 1980s, uh, there was this quip that uh, we see computers everywhere except in the productivity statistics. Um, that is to say, we invested a huge amount of money in computers and saw no benefit. And then there was this massive uh, productivity boost in the 1990s, which most, most economists attribute to computers. I think we're going to see the same thing with data and AI. That is to say, we're making all these investments now with essentially no return. But 10 years from now, it, it could produce huge returns. Uh, I get asked all the time about AI disruption and are we going to put half the workforce uh, 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 in, uh, unemploy half the workforce. Um, you know, the, the, the first thing to understand about, about technologies is that it's not about substituting for humans. The, the technologies like bulldozers are much more efficient than shovels, and they substitute for humans. But they don't actually make people poorer. And the reason is they, a bulldozer requires a higher skill level than operating a shovel. That is, even though it's a substitute for humans, it's a complement for human skills. It asks more of the workers than uh, a shovel does, it, the, that technology. On the flip side, a calculator, which does math for a, for a cashier, asks less of the worker. So some te technologies substitute for human skills, some technologies complement human skills and drive higher skill levels. Ultimately, we, if we have a, a roughly infinite number of things to do, we can employ everybody. The question is, do we employ them doing low-skilled activities or do we employ them doing high-skilled activities? If it's high-skilled, we uh, pay them more. So with respect to AI, the jury is still out. It could be different this time. Why? Because this is like a calculator on steroids. It's a much, you know, it's a thinking machine. On the other hand, if you listen to Kai-Fu Lee, who's an AI pioneer and just wrote a book about AI superpowers that I recommend you read, and I also recommend you re read my review of it, which you can find online. Um, if you believe him, he says that general intelligence is uh, centuries, could be centuries away, whereas domain-specific intelligence, reading uh, uh, radiology charts, is here today. If so, it's a complement to humans, not a substitute. Okay, the final thing I want to say, and then I'll shut up, is uh, there's a giant asymmetry between starting a factory and closing down a factory. You can close down a factory today, right? In fact, the Department of Labor occasionally does it. They come in and say, all right, you're not working anymore, stop. You can start a factory. It takes two years, really, to get your supply chain in place and, and build the, the facilities and, and, and so on. It's a, a generally a two-year pro, uh, process. So when you think about volatility, the main, one of the main outcomes of volatility is I shut down stuff and it's over right now. The stuff that now becomes incented to be produced is two years in the future, and that's optimistic in, in, you know, for many high-tech uh, things. And so the effect is, is that we get this like whammy, uh, this, this, this big negative outcome immediately, and then we get a, uh, you know, we have a rosy future that's, that's uh, a long way in the future. And with that, I'll stop. Thanks, Preston. Uh, Scott, uh, please share your thoughts. Uh, that's a lot of energy coming over there. <laughs> Uh, just to give a little background of myself, I actually did graduate from GPS 29 years ago, so um, I do have some connection to the school. 
And I'm a child of globalization too. I was uh, born in London, England, grew up and worked in Malaysia, Philippines, Brazil, Japan, Korea, Belgium, US, and so on. Currently living in, in Seoul. So uh, globalization for me is just a norm. Now, I, I want to predicate my statements first by saying I thank you for your presentation, Jeff. Um, it was very insightful, um, but I disagree and I agree. I agree with your, with your um, comments because you're giving me the long-term view. Now, I think the one part that you left out, perhaps, is that there's a continuum of different technologies in different companies or, say, um, industries where it will follow at a different pace. Right? So in my industry, which is construction equipment, we're a bit slower. So I don't think globalization is dead, um, but I think perhaps you're right. At the way it is going today, we might have some issues. So back to the, the question around uncertainty. We have some good news and some bad news, right? The bad news typically is uncertainty paralyzes CEOs. Uncertainty paralyzes organizations. But the type of uncertainty that we have today is not the normal uncertainty that says we're dead. I think we're half dead. And the reason why I say that is because the uncertainty which is presented today is not with any kind of clarity. Remember the uh, famous guy in the past, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns? We're in the unknown unknown territory. And that's why, in a sense, I think CEOs, at least I have, have started to, in a sense, ignore the uncertainty because we've got to move on because things are not being thought through. You know, the first thing that Trump did with, with regards to tariffs, he said, steel, we got to protect American steel. And by doing this, it's going to be great for American companies. Well, guess what? Most of what I produce in America is actually sold in America. We do over two and a half billion dollars of business in America. It's costing me money. And we're sourcing most of our steel from America. So how could this happen, right? Well, you tariff imports, and what happens is that you have to, uh, you actually cause higher demand on your local suppliers. So maybe the steel companies are making more money. But everybody else that's using steel is making less money, which is not a problem until you think about the rest of the equation. And the rest of the equation says, that our competitors are actually getting an edge on us. Okay? They're getting cheaper steel now because the demand for foreign steel has gone down even though we don't source foreign steel. But for everybody else, the demand of foreign steel has gone down, which means the price of foreign steel goes up, the price of domestic steel goes up, I mean goes down and up. And we, an American manufacturer, are at a disadvantage. This wasn't supposed to happen. It's costing me 60, 70 million dollars this year. And then you start talking about tariffs on things that are coming in, all these high-tech items that are coming in. And so we source, let's say, counterweights. I don't know if you're familiar with what a counterweight is, but it's a chunk of steel that you put on the back of an excavator. It balances the machine. Well, guess what? We're going to have to pay 10%, maybe 25% tariffs on these items. And our competitors are actually going to get it for, with no tariffs and then import it into the US, right? So you're actually at a point where you don't know what the policies are going to do, whether it's going to be beneficial or detrimental to your business. So now what we have to do is we have to make an assumption of what we think the future is going to look like despite what the US government does and despite what's going to happen within the global economy, which is a very, very kind of a dangerous and precarious place to be. But that's, that's the kind of the new order now. So we're only half dead because there, there are things that are impacting us in different ways, but half dead because we're still moving forward. So globalization, I don't think it's dead for us. We need to make sure that these trade wars end because for me, trade wars is just, it's a lose-lose situation. It causes currency fluctuations. It causes a lot of abnormalities, which then just changes the, the, the face of your business on a daily basis. So the rate of change, of policy change in the government also has to change. And that's, that's where, I, again, my half-dead comment comes in. It's just changing so fast that you can't keep up with it. And to your comment, Preston, if we're going to start up something, it takes a long time. And because it takes a long time, by the time you start working on it, something else is changing in, uh, you know, up in uh, Capitol Hill. So 
that's really my comments around that is we've got to slow the pace of change. We've got to get rid of the unknown unknowns. We've got to open up the trade barriers and make sure that we have known unknowns, that there creates some predictability or some forecasting of what we think is going to happen that actually is going to help us in the future. Scott, thank you for your comments. Uh, my first question is going to be uh, directed at Preston. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot as the representative from Silicon Valley right here. Um, so we've, we've heard from Jeff that we've heard voices in the room about globalization for a long time. Uh, those voices, uh, they've been telling the same story, but they're new voices. They're new giants. In the, uh, in the business space, uh, and they're in Silicon Valley, but we don't hear from them on globalization. But it, directs, uh, it directly affects Silicon Valley, as you pointed out, through immigration, and it's going to start directly affecting even through tariffs and even through uh, downstream industries and manufacturing. So what is uh, the role of Silicon Valley businesses in this global conversation, this conversation about globalization? So I think actually, uh, Silicon Valley, of course, has been very tightly involved in globalization. Uh, Amazon operates in most companies, countries. Uber operates in most countries. Google tried to operate worldwide, uh, uh, had to pull out of China. Um, uh, much of Silicon Valley looks at, at creating a model which then can be replicated around the world. The thing that was different, I think, was ta and for, uh, Microsoft operates in 170 some countries. Um, I think the thing that's different is Silicon Valley start, uh, you know, had this meant mindset of governments in the way, we want to move faster than government, let's just try to stay away from government as best as possible. Um, th th that was kind of the, the mindset. So you didn't hear them saying, we need open uh, uh, trade, we need open immigration. Well, you do hear about H-1B visas every year. But, but you didn't hear very much from them, but it didn't mean that they didn't care. They cared a lot because they're trying to operate worldwide. Um, and, and as the companies get older and more mature, they start realizing we need to have a voice. And, and you're hearing more and more, uh, at least you're seeing the expenditures. I don't know that you're actually hearing all that much, but, but you, you see that the, the top um, Washington lobbyists tend to be tech firms now, at least in terms of expenditure. And so uh, I do think that they're, they're pretty heavily engaged in supporting, but quietly, uh, uh, open, openness in trade, in, in, uh, in immigration. Thanks. Um, I'd like uh, Scott to sort of comment on uh, a similar uh, question. So what is the role of uh, the downstream manufacturing firms, the, the firms that are uh, the consumers of products like steel that are attracting these tariffs. What do you see as your role in uh, in this conversation? So when I first invited you to be a part of this panel, you thought you didn't belong on this panel. You very much belong on this panel, and we would like to hear your voice about how would you approach, if you had to say anything to President Trump right now about his war on China, <laughs> keep it PG, please. Um, what would you say? I, w I would say, please, think it through. Just think it through. Just a few more whys, and then he'll get to a point where he says, hmm, maybe why not, right? I mean, you talk about we're going to close the borders of Mexico, right? Well, think about this. Every company is really has a globally integrated supply chain right now, has sourced the best of the best components from all over the world. So even if I have a $100,000 machine and I have a $1 item that's coming from Mexico, that $1 item stops everything, right? So you just have to think it through because you, you, you make some changes and you make some, some policies and it's, it's not really fully thought through and it has some very, very dire consequences to our business. So to that point, I guess that's what Jeff was talking about, localization. And that's, that's going to take decades. Um, it, it is not a simple thing. If you think about the amount of engineering and the optimization and the functionality that we have to get from each and every component that we put into our machines, which is quite often 10,000 components, 
this is just a, it's an unbelievable task. So what we need is actually we need to work with our supply chains to maintain that flow and to maintain it in a way that is actually fair and equitable on both sides. And that's a, the essence of what Trump is trying to do, is fair and equitable trade. And there is an understanding that it gets worse before it gets better. But we still have to do it in a way that perhaps has a little bit more of a soft landing as opposed to a hammer. So I'll ask, uh, I'll ask all our panelists now. So we are uh, celebrating the 30th anniversary of the School of Global Policy and Strategy. And we're looking towards educating the next generation of diplomats that will be tackling these questions. So I'll ask each of you, what do you see as priorities uh, for a school of public policy uh, in educating uh, the next generation of economic and commercial diplomats? And Laura, since you are actually an educator, I'm going to start with you. And we'll just go around. Yeah, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the moments that I don't like being an A. Um, <laughs> is this on? Yes. It's 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 complex that you ask. Hello. Uh, this because I, I'm sure everyone everyone is um, trying to think how, how best to prepare uh, students for the brave new world. Um, and and it is tough because I think it's changing. And it's changing, and, and we need them to be able to adapt. Uh, so, so, so whatever we're approaching it, I, I do think it has to be a curriculum that gives them the basics to be able to think and, and adapt. And interestingly, that, that I do believe does have the math, the computer, the IED, but, but I also do think it has a lot of history. Um, because I, I do think we learn a lot from the mistakes of the past, uh, and, that is the, uh, and that is a part that we de tend not to stress as much when we're thinking about how, how to prepare our students later. And again, it's, it's not that history has all, all the, all the um, answers, um, but, but I do think going broader than just the last 10 years, the t last 20 years, the last 30 years, does also give some appreciation of, of the changes we have been able to do uh, going better. So, so if anything, the history. Uh, two things. Uh, I really do believe, uh, again, coming from the other side of the world, that um, the mental models that everyone has in the school, the teachers, uh, faculty, and students, and every business, I think we need to change our mental models of what globalization is. We need to build new mental models. And also, the students have to understand that uh, businesses today need a new playbook. And one specific thing I'll point out, again, as part of all the conversations I've had, one of the things that I realized is most businesses today are not very good at understanding the geopolitical shifts and uncertainties and what does it mean for the businesses because they never had to deal with it. And the school is uniquely positioned to build that capability in the students and then offer it to uh, the companies that they join. Well, first, you don't want everybody to do the same thing. In fact, if you're in business and your competitor does something, best you do something slightly different or even a lot different rather than do the same thing and have everybody doing the same thing. Um, you see this play out in the tech sector where every phone looks the same. They copy whatever Apple did. That's a terrible idea. And in fact, they're finally growing up and starting to learn that lesson, but it's taking them along too long. Um, with that said, uh, the, uh, our ability to manipulate large databases and just the existence of large databases is a pretty big shift from what was around 30 years ago. 30 years ago, it was hard to get data. It took you forever to clean it. And at the end of the day, you only had uh, very limited size data. So we need a large, a much larger number of people who can master large data than we did before. And that's one of the things that I would say is ought to be uh, an increasing part of the curriculum. Thank you. So this is the tough part about going last, right? <laughs> but um, yeah, clearly for me, it's about connecting the dots. Um, you have to be able to um, digest and experience things that you haven't experienced. And that's what makes you successful. So to have the tools to be able to connect the dots, and a lot, I agree, 
computer science and data analytics and understanding how that works, not necessarily being able to do all the programming behind it, but understanding how it works along with the geopolitical structures and how government works and policies and strategies and so on, and being able to utilize those components to be able to connect the dots in any situation that you're in, I think that's, that's really the, the key to success. Thanks, Scott. So I'm going to change uh, gears a little bit and put on my trade policy hat. Um, and I'm going to talk for a little bit uh, and ask the panel a little bit about the WTO and their thoughts on the WTO, the future of the WTO, uh, and the U.S.'s role. Um, uh, this was one of the questions that I, I posed to my panel um, before uh, they came, and uh, hopefully they have some thoughts on it. Um, so as an economist, of course, like Laura, uh, we're very much free traders, and the more the merrier. Uh, but we've clearly seen that there are some challenges operating in the multilateral system, like the WTO. How do you get 132 countries to agree to anything? They operate uh, based on uh, unanimity. Uh, that's pretty much impossible to get anything done. So on the one hand, this might actually be good for uncertainty, that certainly creates a lot of stickiness in the process. On the other hand, it makes it a very not dynamic institution. So my question for the panel is, what do you see as some of the major challenges for a multilateral institution like the WTO? Uh, do you see that there's any future for the WTO or, or a version of the WTO uh, in this uh, global uh, economic order? Laura, I'll start with you. So, I, it, I think we should have an institution like the WTO. Like, um, th this is sort of when people complain about the United Nations and they want to get rid of it. We, wa we want something like the United Nations. Perhaps not what we have now, but some institution uh, like that. Right now, the WTO, as you said, it is not advancing. And I do think it's the complexity of the process and the way it was created that won't allow it to advance. So its existence right now just limits crazy, extremely crazy things. But again, if you have leaders that don't care, it's not going to limit anything. And at the core is the problem we don't have an enforcement. And the retaliation, that is the only way we can try to uh, deal with disputes, actually hurts the, 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 the country starting it. There's an interesting report from the European Union that some of the things the U.S. has been doing is hurting the U.S. more than the European Union. And, and that it will always exist. We won't have an international court of justice or an enforcement. So, so as I said, we do need parties to want to play by the rules. But as it is right now, everyone knows the WTO is not going to advance. Sadly, that means we're going to get more bilaterals. And bilaterals help big countries. It doesn't help small countries uh, like mine. Um, in these, for example, the UK thought they were going to get a great deal from the US, and they're not going to get a great deal from, from the US. They're going to see that not having the EU on the other side is going to hurt them big time. But, but it, as I said, we can have many ideas of the quota, so on and so forth, and unless there's willingness by the big players to, to engage the international system, it's, it's hard to move forward. Like, we just don't have any other way than willingness to, to participate. I think I know what you're going to say. <laughs> no, I think there's a very a critical question in the sense that uh, given the way trade structures and economics are, are, are moving, uh, are trade flows, uh, there is a lesser role of the traditional WTO, I feel. But I think there is uh, some very fundamental questions that also have to be resolved, particularly around data flows and services. And uh, if you look at the growth, uh, the digital services and uh, data flows is actually growing much faster than physical flows. But there is still no agreement how do we maximize it and how do we share and how, how, what are the rules. And to me, that is the biggest problem. If individual countries create individual rules, then we will create in the short term challenges. So WTO has a rule or a mechanism like WTO has a role, but uh, I do believe for the traditional uh, kind of role that they played, uh, that is uh, perhaps less important. Thank you. Preston. <laughs> so I'm an optimist in my personal life and a pessimist about this. Um, <laughs> you know, the League of Nations failed. 
the UN, actually, if you, if you split international organizations, and, and in fact, look at cartels. So international cartels are legal. OPEC is legal. There's no like law against. And, and the ones that historically have worked were the ones that had a dominant partner. NATO is an example of this, right? NATO works as long as the United States is footing most of the bill. Um, when, when a country like the United States can kind of pull out, in the end, these organizations are effectively toothless, and we have not developed a strategy for an international governance. I have a little bit of hope that climate change might actually wise us up. It might be a way for us to become more of one world, but you have at least a third of the United States that think this whole idea of one world is a, is a conspiracy against them. And so, um, you know, it's a, it's a way of vaccinating their children. I, 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 so I despair over how this is going to work, and I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you for your pessimism. Scott, please. Uh, pretty much a common theme. I, uh, you know, if you, if you look at the construct of what's going on today, um, the, the whole idea of benevolence or, or a big brother helping a little brother, I think this is all gone. You know, the bilateral agreements are evidence of that. It's, it's what hammer do I have against you and what do you have against me and then we'll knock something out and the bigger guy wins every time. And that's what's going on. So it's almost like technology. WTO is old technology. Bilateral is new technology. Unfortunately, because philosophically I don't agree to that, but that's what's happening. So, and so I'll that's, just correct that's, you. Bilateral is nowhere near new technology. This goes to Laura's point. Uh, we need to know some of the history. We got the WTO because we had bilaterals, and the WTO and the GATT, its predecessor, was an improvement on bilaterals. So, my Assuming under the construct of benevolence and doing the right thing and this type of thing. And that's what's gone. It, so was, it was mutually beneficial <laughs> for the countries that engaged in it. And so my question is, is there a mutually beneficial outcome? We've had the U.S., we've had the EU, they've had their time for mutually beneficial trade. We have a new player on the playing field. It's China. How do we incorporate them into the next global trading regime? That's the question. I put it to you. Preston. So, so one, one th there is a... Um, uh, there's a pendulum. And, and so as you say, we've been through bilateralism. Part of the reason the WTO worked is we realized the other way didn't work. So as we go down the bilateralism again, maybe we will learn that was a failure. Everybody needs to wise up. And the question is whether we do that before we've destroyed the earth or not. <laughs> I, I, Jeff, I wanted, but I, but I go for it. I actually think uh, Preston's point on using climate change as a kind of a imp accelerator and maybe start, you know, with a really lots of people saying China and the U.S. needs to do something together on this as a way to kind of reinvigorate the Paris summit. I actually think it's a big idea, a right idea, and one that people can get behind and so I, I like that spin on it. Sorry. No. Thank you. We, we like your points. I think this is a great time to open it up to the audience. Uh, so, so just one comment. Um, <laughs> let, let me just remind you that the person who led a lot of the global climate change was from Costa Rica, Cristiano Figueres. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but again, it, when you look, go at the history of these institutions, there was always great leadership. And that is what's lacking right now. Like, people do matter. And right now, <laughs> in the US, the head is not being, is not leading. Uh, if you see the history of the US, Eisenhower was very pro-trade, and he kept many at bay. And that's a lot of the impetus for that change. Also, when the WTO, you can always see people doing the right thing and taking those leadership positions. So it's not trivial who is in charge of the US. You may still want the Republican Party to win, but the Republican Party has better people than the one that is right now heading it. So, <laughs> and, and it does matter. It does matter. Um, sadly, it does matter. In history, important people have made changes, and, and it needs to start there. Okay, so uh, I'm going to say one more thing before we open it up to the audience. It's really on this matter of leadership. Uh, if the U.S. steps out of the global ring, 
a leader will emerge. We're leaving, we're leaving that a vacuum, and China will step into that vacuum. China wants that role. And the question is, do we accommodate that? Do we take on the role as the child of China or a partner with China? And that's the question I want to put uh, to the the audience, and I'll see if my panelists want to comment on that first. If not, I will throw it out to the audience. Earn them. You know, it's not a question of China will emerge. I mean, China is already there on the stage. I mean, the question really for the U.S. is uh, how do we create a leadership of any kind of forum where you have uh, two countries which are competing with each other, which have different uh, in some sense, uh, views of the world and economic and political structure, but still we have to find common grounds of working together to make uh, the world a better place. And unfortunately, that dialogue seems to have broken down. Well, again, back to history, the U.S. and the E.U. seem to have found a way to do that at some point. They're more similar, albeit, but they found a way to work together. So with that, I will put it to my audience. I don't know if we have a microphone. Yes, thank you. And, and for everyone who's going to comment, just say your name and introduce yourself, please. Uh, Don Rosenberg. Uh, first, I want to compliment this panel. It's really been spectacularly um, interesting. Uh, you've raised a lot of great, great questions. On your picking up on the last um, exchange, um, uh, which relates to China and um, previous trade agreements, um, I think the difference is that now there are basically I take your point about the EU, but with U.S. and China, you've got uh, competing hegemons. You've got, in the past, it was the U.S., basically, whether it was bilateral or even multilateral. You hear all the time from people in Europe that one of the problems with trade agreements from their perspective it was that it was an institution to allow the U.S. to impose not just its views of trade, but its views of standardization and commercialization and all those kinds of things. So they, they saw the U.S. as really the, the leader of that. And it had its good side and its bad side, depending upon your perspective. The difficulty, I think, one of the difficulties with China now is that um, you've got this competing uh, uh, war between two, or, two countries who want to control and impose their own uh, views of the world on on those trade trading partners, and while I think it's absolutely worth continuing to work at, uh, that I think distinguishes this to some degree from from the past. I will now, uh, if anyone would like to respond to that, uh, if I think in perhaps the example that is more relevant is the relation of the U.S. with the Soviet Union, and. There were tough moments, and there were moments that luckily there was good leadership. If not, there would have been World War III. But it's not clear to me that the U.S. totally disengaged, um, which feels like it's what's happening now. Um, perhaps that is a more relevant example than the relation U.S.-Europe, which in many ways are, are more similar. I'm not going to deny there are legitimate concerns. Uh, the violations of intellectual property are legitimate concerns. But by the way, that is also how the U.S. developed. Uh, the U.S. would take all books and so on from Europe in the 19th century and copy them in the U.S. without paying uh, property rights, um, <laughs> by the record. But again, I'm not denying there are not real um, concerns and legitimate concerns. The way it's being approached, it just doesn't feel that it's after the legitimate concerns. It just feels that it's, again, random thoughts depending on the day and uh, what he wakes up and smells. Um, <laughs> but disengaging doesn't seem to be the right answer also. Okay, uh, we have a few more questions. So maybe we just sort of uh, take three questions and then we can respond. Thank you, Renee and the panel. Very good discussion. My name is Eden Cohen. I work for uh, Qualcomm. There's a few others, apparently. My question is mostly for Mr. Park, I guess, but anyone really. So clearly the trade tariffs are hurting, they're painful, and the short, in the short term we're losing, except for a few steel manufacturers. But it's clear that we have a very broad consensus, I think, that China, just as we just said, has neglected the global trading order in a very vehement way. Something has to be done. Now, the administration is doing something 
We can disagree with the tactics, but something is taking place. And shouldn't be, we give Mr. Lighthizer and the rest of the people working on it the leeway to succeed, even if it means that there is uncertainty in the process? Yeah, the, the comment I made is that it's going to get worse before it gets better. So perhaps the answer is yes, but I'm, I'm with him over here too is that the, when it gets worse, I hope it just doesn't go completely worse. And that's, that's a, a very fine line. You know, there's some black swans out there and it's hard to predict these things. If you have an economic war with China, which is already happening, but when, it, when the tariffs actually do kick in, and if they do kick in, um, it's not just the China-US thing. It permeates throughout all of Asia and once it permeates throughout that, now you've got a global depression or some global calamity that's going to happen. That's the danger. So how far is Trump willing to take it? Does he understand the deep down consequences of what he's doing? If it's minor and we get a little bit of a slump and it comes back up, yeah, it will get better, but it'll be worse first. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough one. And that's the problem is do we need to play with that line? Do we really need to try to get that even playing field to that extent? Because you're never going to get an even playing field with China. And the reason why I say that is because they don't have the same ethical constructs or political policies or any kind of rules in their country that's equivalent to ours over here. So what that means is that there will be advantages. And, and we talked about technology of the future, AI and automation, autonomous drive and things like this. Guess what? A few people get hurt there or something happens, nobody gets sued. They just move on. Uh, data uh, privacy and things like this, it's not as a big deal over there. So they're able to process through and get through the, the technology side much quicker than what we can. So how are you going to even the playing field on that? I don't know. Preston also respond to this. So, so I want to make two points. One is that clarity and consistency are really important about uh, uh, dealing with China or dealing any, with any trade policies and we're being with we have neither of those Th that is you actually want to say this is what's really important IP is really important we're not going to give give on that issue or not I mean it, but, but you have to pick on it your issues and then stick to them and instead we swing back and forth and I think that is just unnecessary uh, uh, and I don't even mean from administration to administration. I mean within the administration. Um, and that, <clears throat> that, so that's just unnecessary uh, volatility. The other point I want to make, though, is, is that um, I, I actually think the, the competition with China is in, in a way being overstated. Um, China is, has been phenomenally good at, at manufacturing and especially at complex supply chains. So, so if you look at their phone manufacturing, it's, it's astounding. Um, their television manufacturing, these kinds of you know, complex machinery, they're doing an amazing job of that. If you look at what they're doing outside of that arena, it's not been that impressive. So in particular, in the software industry, the U.S. firms haven't succeeded in China, and I make that to be pro Chinese protectionism for the following reason. Everywhere else, the U.S. firms have done great. So if you look at Iceland or if you look at Indonesia, Singapore, it's American firms, not Chinese firms. Uh, this also says outside of that one arena of manufacturing, which is a huge and important and a, b a big deal, but of course they're a huge and important and a big deal country too, it's not so obvious that, that the United States, say, suffer, you know, suffers a uh, comparative disadvantage against China, except in the Chinese market itself. Thank you. Uh, Bob. Yes, first, I caution one point. The Chinese are fat. One moment. We're going to get you a microphone. Thank you. I, on, I, I, wasn't gonna, I, was, I had two other points, but I just want to make one point on what you just said. The Chinese... Okay, yep. better now. I just wanted to add one caveat to what you said. The Chinese are fabulous at apps. The Chinese apps blow us away in terms of their applicability to the average citizen far better than we have in virtually all areas. So I think you're right on most points, but I, I think they are very good at applying technology to the average citizen in ways that we're not. But I, I, would, I just wanted to make two points. One. 
I would very, very seriously caution you against using the Russian, the Soviet American Cold War analogy to apply to the current environment. It is highly irrelevant and very misleading in the sense that if you look at trade, now you were looking at it in a broader sense, so I take your point, but if you look at trade, more of the countries in the Asian and to a degree Latin American and African spheres trade with China as their major trading partner than with the US. So they, the Chinese have a lot of leverage over these countries and they don't just want to change the rules. Xi Jinping once said, I don't just want to change the rules, I want to change the playing field on which the game is played. They, they, they're not ready, quite ready to do this, but, they're so, but with the Soviet Union, very few countries in the world had the Soviets as their major trading partner. In, in, because they didn't succeed, no, because they didn't. Oh, no, uh, they didn't. They Cuba, didn't. they tried to get into Chile, they did try. Oh, that, Cuba and oh, Chile. That we're, we're, we're talking about, <laughs> we're talking about Europe, East Asia. They trade, they trade. How many countries, how many countries saw, saw Russia, the Soviet Union, as an attractive trading partner, investment partner? Oh. Now, because the Russians didn't try. Okay, so well, we're gonna try. let Bob my and point Laura, is, my point uh, is we're gonna the get them some boxing no, my, gloves. My point is in the current, uh, and uh, yeah, in, they'll yeah, take the, it outside. The point is in the current environment, we'll try succeed, the current environment is a lot of these countries see China as their major, major trading partner to a greater degree than the US. For whatever reasons, that's the situation today. Uh, and therefore, you can't really go back to a world that's divided up where the U.S. can pull those countries back because the trade links you're talking about have been established over a 20-year period. And they're much more attractive than the Soviet Union was at that point. The, all the numbers indicate that. But the bigger danger is if the U.S. not only tries to influence the trading system, but goes to countries, as with the case of the new USMCA and says, look, you can either trade with us and have a deal. If you trade and have a free trade agreement with a non-market economy, we're going to cut you off or we're going to impose severe penalties on you. So my, my con concern is if this world gets so divided, then we're going to get a situation where the US forces countries to choose between the United States and China. I think that would be a very serious problem. Okay, thank you very much. We, uh, so we, we have several comments from the audience that I definitely want us to get in. Uh, so please go ahead, the gentleman right here. Yeah, uh, John Negroponte here, and I, I spent a certain amount of time conducting the U.S.-China uh, political dialogue at the, uh, in, in the last Bush administration. I mean, to Bob's point and also to Jeff's earlier, I mean, this, I think this comes down to an issue of whether we end up with uh, one world and two systems or one world and, and one system. And I think the Chinese in the past, and I'm sure we're going to have more discussion about China as the day goes on, have wanted to give the post-World War II global order a real chance. I mean, I've heard the Chinese, the actual current Chinese foreign minister say one of their five policy priorities is to preserve the global system that was created uh, after World War II with respect to trade and economics and so forth. I think they've wanted a bigger share and I think they've taken uh, a, and a bigger voice in some of the institutions that were created where they were frozen out and, we, and so on and so forth or they didn't have a big enough cut of the deal and then we reacted rather I think uh, uh, immaturely, if you will, to the creation of the Asian infrastructure and investment bank that they created and so forth. So I think it's going to come down uh, to whether we are able to do things together or that we really decide to go separately to your question on climate change, for example. La last point. I don't think, Renee, they may have aspirations. But when you speak to them privately and when you conduct these dialogues, and I've done it as I've, I go and sort of track two stuff every year, they say they don't want to supplant the United States in its leadership role 
uh, in the world, and they don't feel ready for it. And if you just look back at our own history, we surpassed the British economy uh, in GDP and so forth after the Civil War, 10 years after our Civil War. And how long did it take us before we moved to a sort of ascendant position in global affairs? It wasn't until the next century. So I, I don't think these things happen quite so fast. Thank you. I'll ask Teresa to allow the next guest. So uh, Greg Arnold, and a uh, quick question for the panel. Uh, so ha lots of diagnosis about the problem with China, but you're president of the United States today. So what do you do to achieve a fair and equitable economic relationship with China? I'll let my panelists answer. <laughs> <laughs> Starting with Scott. Boy, that, that's a tough one. That, that really is. I mean, it, it, you know, you got to go back to the status quo in a sense. Um, because the way it's structured right now, we can operate in China and we can operate fairly in China. So um, the, the, the leveling of the playing field is in a sense that we start playing a bigger, bigger role in China. And that will eventually lead to something that's a little bit more fair across the board, as opposed to putting in political structures that would kind of artificially create something that creates a lot of waste. Uh, so, unfortunately, we're not going to have time for everyone to respond, but I do want to mention I am uh, giving a talk tomorrow about the power of the status quo. Thank you so much for saying status quo just now. Uh, please continue, Preston, and then we'll take another question. So, I think the, I think the WTO has done a really good job over its history. Uh, the reason, so, so I would, if I was, there's a reason I'm not president. The, many of them, um, but I would probably be betting on the WTO and trying to uh, strengthen rather than weaken that organization. Thank you, Preston. So we have a question in the back, a couple questions that we'll take. Hi, I'm Peter Gorovich. I'm an emeritus faculty member here. I wanted to ask this terrific panel a question about compensating the losers. The analysis, in a way, has been relations amongst countries, but it's hard to understand what happens amongst countries without looking about what's going on inside. One of the reasons that we're having this reaction to, as Renee pointed out, we had this consensus around international trade after World War II, but a big part of that was the development of a welfare state and a bunch of other things. I wonder in your analysis of the relationship between countries, what recommendations would you make about compensating the losers from trade, which we know does take place? Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I'm gonna ask Laura to start with this uh, question. Eliminating losers is, is probably very difficult. That is the case of technology and trade. But as I said, there are ways that you can mitigate some of the costs. Now, if you're someone who didn't finish high school, it's just going to be hard in the US as it's going to be hard anywhere. I just don't know any country now that someone who just doesn't have a, a little bit more than a high school degree can have a good life. And I have always been shocked that in the US, there's a lot of people who just don't finish high school. The US is also not very good in the healthcare system. The US is also not very good in retraining. Those things have always been in the power of the US, and they're all things that in many cases are state and local. I, I see, for example, this, what is the state, Kansas, that completely took away the funding from primary and secondary education. It's, it's hard to compete when you don't have a standing a, a good basic education. I think that can be done. That doesn't require international institutions. That has to be done within. And it's always been, for me as a foreigner, kind of shocking that the US, the healthcare discussion becomes this discussion whether you want to go to hell or you want to kill someone. And it's just healthcare. And they don't want to do it. And, and that I do think is more political than economical. But the tools exist. It's just the US chooses in certain states and localities not to use them. Thank you. Uh, Arundam, do you have any thoughts on this? I just have uh, one thought, which is, uh, you know, both have to go together. If you don't increase the size of the pie, there will be much less to share. And I think uh, unless you also find a way of increasing the pie, and as we just discussed, it has to be by bringing China and U.S. on the same page. But uh, the distributional strategies within all countries, I mean, not just in U.S., but also in India and many other countries have not really been what they should be. And I think uh, we need to focus on both sides. Thank you. Uh, we'll take one more question from the back. 
Hi, I just wanted to thank the panel. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Britt Mitchell. And I just wanted to bring one more aspect to this conversation that hasn't really been addressed, um, that, but I, it was brought to my attention by some of the comments of uh, Laura. Um, one of the pr challenges that I see in the US, but also throughout the world order, is this issue of dealing with women and dealing with women who have children. And in the United States, we have one of the most highly educated female workforces in the world, but it's hugely underutilized because businesses have such high expectations of what they expect of their workers, and so you have very highly tech-savvy, skilled workers who are unable to work within the field. And then this goes back to what you were saying about leadership. We then fail to cultivate female leaders in the world, and you also talked about Costa Rica, which has been such a leader in climate change, and of course, um, Lara Chinchilla, who was the president of, the, um, of Costa Rica during during that period did so much to lead that and of course being a part of that was cultivating her as a leader through uh, the pathway that she took. So I'm really interested in how much attention is being paid to that at the international level and how not only in the United States but in other countries attention is being paid to making sure that we cultivate this half of the uh, population and particularly the you know 60-70% of women who have children and step back maybe for a few years or a certain amount of time during that period, how do we overcome those challenges and make sure that women continue to progress? Preston, I'm gonna ask you to take this question as a representative from Silicon Valley. Yeah, oh, great. Um, <clears throat> so first, it's a great question, and is a, uh, w whenever you have such a large level of underutilized resources, it matters to society uh, hugely that we, that we address uh, that issue. And Silicon, you know, I've been part of Silicon Valley trying to deal with uh, how do we get more uh, female and minority um, uh, software coders and so on into the company and develop them as leaders. At the same time, I can tell you from personal experience that offers that I would make to um, uh, female candidates would be turned down in order to go to the government at less than half the pay because the federal government does a better job of uh, accommodating childcare and accommodating uh, uh, childbirth and, and the, the pressures. So um, I do not have the answer to this. I know that we invest a lot of resources and we haven't really succeeded. Let me just add to that that the U.S. doesn't have a federal maternity policy. When I moved to the U.S., that was a shock to me. Like, it's business by business basis. Again, the, the whole welfare system in the US probably would benefit from some rethinking, and that is at the state government level. It doesn't require international institutions. It's just unwillingness to do it. Uh, and again, I, I, I think leadership, business leadership there is welcome. Thanks, Laura. So I'm, I'm going to end with one final observation and question. So the, the title of this pal uh, panel was Policy Uncertainty and Business. Uh, and we started with the observation of these populist uh, backlash against globalization. I want to thank Peter uh, in the back for bringing up the issue of inequality and compensating the losers. We have the populist backlash simply because there have been losers uh, and they haven't been fully compensated. So I'd like to ask the remain the, for, for the remaining minutes, each panelist to think about how would you in your specific industry or field uh, think about compensating the losers so we can mitigate this uh, populist backlash against globalization, given that we have it at least for the next 10 years or so. Scott, I'll ask you to start there. Wow. Compensating the losers. Um, in, in, in our business, I mean, we like to think that we, there are no losers. I mean, we, we try to be fair across the board. I agree with Preston. We haven't been good enough with uh, diversity and, uh, you know, whether it's gender or, or race. And, and perhaps there might be some losers coming from that. But it doesn't mean that we're not trying because we understand the value of diversity in the workplace and how it goes. And we understand that we have to have fairly compensate completely um, blind to to that side of the equation and just looking at the R&R, the roles and responsibilities, the job description that that individual does, regardless of if they're an immigrant or a male or female or what have you. And this is what we do. But the fact of the matter is, is that um, in our industry especially, 
we don't get as many qualified women, say, applicants. That doesn't mean we stop doing what we're doing. We still need to do what we need to do. But somehow we also have to go across maybe back to elementary school and, and the education system and the way that, that society kind of prepares individuals because, uh, frankly, women don't come to our industry that much. So we try to promote them. We try to highlight them. And we try to, you know, I have, um, I think, 20-some-odd uh, percent of my executives in North America are female, which is pretty high if you look at actually the number of female that are actually in the organization outside of some other functions like, say, HR and, and things like that. So um, we could do more, and, and we continue to do more. But it's got to be a coordinated effort really across um, answering the bigger question. So, so one of the big sins that has caused uh, uh, so much pain is the fact that we tied health care to employment. And the problem with tying health care to employment is that when we need to change, you need to go work for another company because the company you're in is declining while these other companies are booming. All of a sudden, you have existing preconditions and other issues, and, and maybe you need more training. So you've got nine months or a year where you're getting more training and don't have health care for your family. This is something of a train wreck. By the way, it's a giant disadvantage for the United States in competing against Canada and the EU where they don't have this issue. Now, they have other issues, but they don't have this particular issue. Uh, so, so a large chunk, and I don't mean to say it's all of it, because it isn't at all all of it, is, uh, is health care. The second thing is, I, I actually got, uh, I, I did some work back in the 90s on worker retraining. And our worker retraining isn't, well, let me say, uh, in, in the state of Texas in the 1990s, fully half the retraining funds went to teaching people how to cut hair. This is, you know, training people for a job that pays minimum wage is not a good strategy. Um, so so we, we're, our, our worker retraining is kind of a shambles, and, 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 and we need more of that. Uh, in my specific industry, to, to uh, finish with the, with the question you actually asked me, uh, uh, the, it, the, what, what Milton Friedman called the negative income tax, that is the universal basic income, is all the rage. Well, the thing that I think is really kind of interesting here is that the intellectual history of, that, of what is now universal basic income was the negative income tax of the arch conservative of the econ economics profession, Milton Friedman. Uh, that was his proposal as a way of, of uh, resolving these issues. And so I, I think that there might actually be a political consensus, if, except that, that we've decided we can't even talk to each other, much less uh, reach a consensus. Can I be a little controversial here? Absolutely. I think this whole uh, narrative of losers is a Western narrative. I mean, if you go to China or India, I mean, they don't talk about losers. And uh, I don't mean that any, in, in a bad way. It, it just sense that uh, given the history, I mean, that's how it has happened. I mean, during this uh, whole shift that is going to happen, India is going to lose a lot of jobs because of, as Jeff said, uh, automation in the IT industry, which is India's uh, shining industry. But we are trying to get and find a solution to that. I think it, it is we have to find a way of getting away from this whole narrative of losers and uh, creating it more as a as a way that we have to solve the problem. It is a problem. I mean, globalization has these uh, issues, and we have to find a way to solve the problem. Be repetitive. I, I do think there's many things that U.S. can improve in terms of welfare, I, and but I do take your point. These losers has a U.S. point of view, and I do think that in the U.S., as I mentioned, many people have benefit, uh, and in the world, many people also have. Uh, the last 60 years has seen the mass reduction of poverty never seen in the history of mankind. So, so a global perspective also helped. But more micro, I'm a true believer in math, and I'm a true believer in teaching kids math. My daughter is 14 years old and she likes uh, coding and I live in New England that is an obsessed part of this country and I'm shocked that she goes to her coding classes and they're for free because they're this program Girls Who Code, they're very few, they're very few. So, so we do need the leaders. I'm one that believes that 
Also, men can teach women. I don't think it has only to be women inspiring women. Men can inspire women, but we need that to happen at the school elementary level. Thanks, Laura. And I uh, really just want to close by saying this has been a fantastic panel. Thank you so much for all your comments and being open-minded. Um, uh, on the issue of women, I just wanted to point out that moving from Stanford Economics Group in the business school, where I was often the only woman in the room, uh, to GPS, where I looked around the, the room at the faculty meeting, and it was about half women. It was shocking. It was a little bit jarring, I have to say. <laughs> So I'm very, very proud of uh, my school for uh, being uh, at the forefront on that. And it does make for a really nice place to work if you're a woman. Um, and just to uh, echo that point about the United States, indeed, this issue of equality and redistribution and compensating the losers, it's a very US and Western idea. But guess what? We're all here. We're all here because we want to be here. I'm here from Jamaica because this is a better place for me. Laura's here from Costa Rica. It's a better place for her, I imagine. Uh, so uh, we all choose to be here because it is a better place to live and work. The issue about Im immigrants, why do the immigrants come here? Because of that opportunity. So I just wanted to sort of tie that point together uh, as we go and think about the rest of, uh, of our day. And I know the next panel is uh, globalization or something like this in the next 25 years. So good luck with answering all those questions again. Uh, I will uh, dismiss you now. Thank you so much for being part of this panel. <laughs> <laughs>